So hello and welcome to this presentation on video for consultants, where we're going to explore why video can be useful, um, how to use it, equipment you might need, some lessons learned, and let's see where we go from there. So I hope you enjoy it. Do remember to click on the subscribe button, as the YouTubers always say, and, and enjoy. So the real useful thing up on the screen, I know, is always have a little thing there to say recording. So what we're going to do then, going to talk about uh, videoing for pe people like us and the different forms it can take. So there's some examples on this um, opening screen, in fact, of things like um, over on the top left or wherever it is. Um, there's one where I actually appeared on TV. That was with um, Pierce, Morgan and various people. That was actually delivered remotely uh, from a coffee shop with me on a Wi-Fi connection and it was not a very good connection at all. So that's probably a good example of bad video for consultants, but it was very useful at getting me a little bit of exposure because it meant I got to go head to head against someone fairly well known. Uh, next one down, you'll probably all recognize the Lloyds of London building where I've done a few videos just on my mobile phone. So it shows that we, we can use things like that as well. Next one down was another TV channel where we did some stuff where I was interviewed in a room in a hotel that I borrowed for the interview. Uh, next one's where I did some YouTube stuff. And then finally, the last one was with uh, a TV and radio presenter who was doing some work around uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency. And we did a, a proper interview with some proper studio equipment and that. So what I'm going to cover off for, for this session is, you know, why video and how it's useful. Uh, a little bit for you to think about you, options of what you may need to consider about how to produce video, kind of equipment. So we we're talking already about green screens now before we'll go into that in a bit more detail later. Uh, the platforms that you can actually use. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, things like YouTube, uh, which is very useful on LinkedIn as well. Talk briefly about how to improve some lessons learned and then some next steps as to where we could take this so as i say this will take about 15 20 minutes and then we'll um open it up because i realize that there are going to be other people who've got lots more experience than me and might be able to offer some advice as well so why video well the, I, I look at video as being used for three things it's you use it as a consultant for marketing and branding yourself you use it as a form of training material and you also repurpose uh, the, the video material that you've produced as well. And I'll explain briefly what that is shortly. So we look at marketing and branding to begin with. So we've got my LinkedIn profile, which shows already how I do um, some video type stuff. And it even says I now deliver like webinars and masterclasses remotely. I've got a YouTube channel, um, which I keep pushing stuff onto. And it's all about brand building, really. So this is all about um, showing what I am, who I am, quite rawly as well. It's quite an honest presentation of me. It's not very glossy. It's not very professional, but it is me. Next area around video is around training. So I deliver webinars and seminars um, either live or via streaming, um, or via Zoom calls like this, or pre-recorded as well. And I tend to put them onto YouTube afterwards as it's a useful way of people re-seeing them. So already that's quite a powerful way of promoting your brand by recording and doing your training, and then repurposing that, which takes us on to the third thing, to replay onto marketing. So they kind of go round on themselves in a way. But I do training courses, then take snippets out of training courses, which I use for part of the marketing and branding. So it's a little bit of effort to get a great benefit from it. So a little bit about you as a consultant. And this is the, the kind of the ultimate thing that I get into conversations about why you should use video. And it comes down to this quote out of uh, the movie Taken, where you know the, the actor saying, you know, what I have is a particular set of skills which may be of interest to your employer. So video is a very, very effective way of conveying uh, your expertise, your knowledge, your ability to communicate things, uh, and your general style as well. And so I've actually had people who've looked at my videos and have then got in touch with me to say, I'll watch one of your videos. It's obvious you actually know what you're talking about, which makes a nice change from some of the other people. So it's very, very effective for that. 
But for you, the, the things to think about for video is, you know, whether you would benefit from some additional tra training in some way for yourself. So things like uh, is media media coaching useful and you can do courses and classes on actually coaching skills um, for presenting in front of the media for TV and radio. I've not done any of those, but I have been to some of the sessions and they are very powerful and, and very useful. Another one is around voice training, and that could be really, really powerful. There's a guy called Roger Love, who is a world renowned trainer in voice, and he teaches actors and business people and this kind of thing. Because I, I discovered I'm not very confident with my voice. And so I tried to improve it by doing some courses now. What I also discovered, most other people aren't confident with their voice either. And we always hate to listen to ourselves. So sometimes by doing a bit of voice training, that, that can improve things. The third thing I mentioned on here, and I'm not going to go into these in, a, in any further detail, is presentation skills. We all know how to present in front of uh, a group of people or on stage or for some of us at our conferences. The presentation skills of how you present yourself remotely or via video are definitely different. And I spend a lot of time looking at people doing videos and they are just so dull and so boring and so animated and that kind of thing. So there's real technique in that. And that leads me on to the fourth thing I mentioned around here about mentoring. And that's something maybe we could pick up uh, separately from this session about whether it's actually worth getting together and buddying up and running ideas across each other so we can learn experience things from each other. So the next thing is around options to produce a video. Uh, and there's, there's two main, main options, which is either getting videos done professionally or done homemade as I describe them. So for the first one with professional, uh, here's, here's a number of examples. So um, they are a mixture of uh, appearances that have been actually on uh, TV channels where they've got full blown studios. The one down in the middle at the bottom was me in a, in a panel discussion on ITV's Good Morning, uh, this time not with P Piers Morgan, where they've got the whole studio set up and very professional. The one to the right of that, the green screen, screen stuff, that was working with a video production con company who actually do media training as well, and they video everything and they, they put it together, so that's quite good. Working my way up with uh, where it says the Your Crypto Club, so that was a promo video for Marcus De Maria, who does a lot of um, crypto and traditional trading. Again, it's a professional type thing. And then the top one was uh, some work I did with the Government Blockchain Association, where we did a Dragon's Den type thing, again, with pro pro um, professional footage. Professionals will really get the best out of you. And I was having a conversation recently, I've included it down at the bottom there, um, a guy who lives locally to me who I've come to know, uh, Red Jacket Media, they actually come along and they, they do video productions for you. So they actually do things like video business cards, which can look very nice indeed. So, so professional is definitely a thing that if you want it to look absolutely TV style, uh, very, very professional production, then that's certainly worth considering. Next approach is what I describe as homemade, which is do it yourself, which is where I think a number of people uh, watching this or listening to it afterwards would be of interest. So I do all my stuff homemade and we'll, we'll take a look at the equipment around that shortly. And then I repurpose it or I publish it onto YouTube or sometimes Instagram uh, and LinkedIn. Equipment is always the thing that people talk, talk about. And so I'm gonna quickly go into four areas around equipment, the hardware that you need, software, backgrounds, for enough green screens comes up again, and some miscellaneous stuff as well. So I've listed off about eight areas here, um, starting off with a camera. I, for the majority of my stuff, simply use the webcam that's built into my camera. I, I should have mentioned at the beginning of this, I'm a very PC person, by which I don't mean politically correct, I mean personal computer that I've got a Microsoft Windows PC. It's got a built-in camera um, and it's very, very good for the stuff I do, which is getting produced usually onto YouTube type stuff. 
I do have um, a Sony Handycam as well, which I occasionally use. The quality of that is excellent, uh, but I just don't bother using it very often. And some people also use DSLRs, which can be quite good. But when you're starting out, initially, all you need is a laptop with a webcam. You don't need anything more. Microphone is something that's really, really important. It's funny, I was speaking to one of the people who were on the call before uh, about things like Yeti microphones, and there are various professional grade ones. I was using a mix of um, a headset microphone that I had. Uh, then I just decided to use the laptop's built in microphone on the Microsoft Surface. This is very good indeed. But for this recording, I'm using uh, a Yeti which is a heading toward professional standard stuff uh, and it's on a separate stand and it's got shock resistance and all sorts of stuff but very very important to get the sound right when, when you're doing these things next thing is lighting um the english daylight is completely unreliable we get clouds we get darkness all this kind of thing so it is very very useful to invest in additional lighting um, I'm on to my second or possibly third ring light at the moment, which are uh, devices that you plug into a USB socket either in the wall or, or on your, um, your computer, and it just provides a uh, much better control of your lighting and makes things much better. Fourth thing is a decent computer. Again, mine is a Microsoft Surface something, I keep forgetting. But I think it's an i7 dual core with about eight megabyte, oh, sorry, eight gigabytes of RAM. And it tends to work okay as long as I don't try and do what I'm doing now too often, which is to have um, OBS software and Zoom and some other stuff all running at the same time. But usually a, a normal laptop is sufficient to begin with. A really useful thing is a second screen. I don't have a second screen at the moment. Um, this is useful for when you're presenting because you can actually see what you're presenting. So what I've done is I've done a really cheap and cheerful uh, trick, which is I've joined this call today on my mobile phone as well. And I'm just using the screen off my mobile phone to actually see what's appearing on the screen from everyone. So that gets away from this whole, I don't know how amateurish you think it sounds when other people are saying, oh, can you see my presentation now? You know, it's like, well, if you've got a second screen or something where you can monitor it, that, that works fine. Um, for those who are really getting into the space of uh, doing videos, then a teleprompter can be very useful. Uh, I don't have one at the moment, which means I tend to read stuff off of Word documents that I've got on the screen. And you can sometimes see my eyes tracking um, the, the Word document rather than looking at the screen. At the moment, because of the way I'm displaying this, that doesn't matter because you can't really see my eyes anyway. But teleprompters are worth considering, and you can get one usually for about a couple of hundred pounds, which uh, is probably a sensible investment if you're going to be doing a lot of presenting. Another thing to consider is around your Wi-Fi and your network. Um, I just use my normal Wi-Fi um, into my router and my normal um, broadband line. The speeds on that seem to be pretty good where I live, but for some people you may need to consider uh, either hard cabling in or getting a, a second line or using 4G or 5G something, which probably takes us on to the last thing to think about when you're doing video as well, is uh, backup and contingency in case any of the above things fail. And the favourite one to fail is your phone line followed by power. Uh, so always be thinking if you're going to do something live, that then have backups for those in some way. Taking us on to software. So... I use uh, a piece of software a lot called OBS. And what OBS does is it acts as a virtual camera. So this is my OBS dashboard at the moment. It allows me to do clever things and hopefully this won't crash the whole thing. So I can do things like I can pull up different backgrounds if I want to, um, or I can just show the PowerPoint without it showing me. Really neat thing about this is that you can be really sneaky. And if you're delivering a presentation and you need to pop away, then you can pull in a recording of something. So that's quite clever because people don't even notice that you've done that. So that, that can be quite handy. So this is OBS. So OBS acts as an intermediary between what your camera sees and then whatever 
uh, the software you're using, such as Zoom, Teams, Google Meet or whatever, is seeing. So it acts as um, a layer in between your camera um, and, the, and the end thing. So that's very useful for doing really clever effects. So I can you know, put, put different backgrounds onto things. Um, there's all sorts of features that we can add in, but I won't get too clever with it because if I do, it will probably all fail on me. But OBS certainly uh, on a PC is something I use. There are other pieces of software that you can use on other computers. Once you've produced a video, uh, it can be useful to have some editing software. So I use VideoPad, which there's a free version of. I actually pay for the paid version, which I think is about $80 or thereabouts. Uh, and it allows you to edit the video, to interlace things, and to just make it things a little bit better, which uh, again, it's just about doing small things, which adds to the professionalism. Next thing is thumbnails. Now, for those who don't know, a thumbnail is when you're looking at something like on YouTube, uh, it shows a little preview screen, uh, kind of a picture typically, that, that's a thumbnail. They are incredibly powerful at improving the marketability of your videos because people will look at the thumbnail and that's what will actually attract them in the first place. That's it's quite a useful thing to be aware of. I use a free piece of software called Canva, which is web-based, and you can use that to produce thumbnails, produce Instagram pages, uh, Facebook post shapes, LinkedIn uh, posts, all this kind of thing. Very, very, very good stuff. And then finally, you sometimes discover that you've been using software like PowerPoint for a while without even re realizing some of the more powerful capabilities. So I discovered a few months ago you can actually record a uh, PowerPoint presentation with you videoed in it within PowerPoint. And you can actually then save that PPT and it saves the whole recording. And I, I didn't realize it did that until I tried it. And the other really useful thing that PowerPoint can do as well is it can do subtitles live uh, as you're actually delivering a presentation. So I've done that a few times now. If I'm giving a talk on a webinar or via Zoom, and I'm using PowerPoint, I turn on the subtitles so that there's anybody of hard of hearing, um, then they can actually see what's being said. So that's a very useful little trick. Next thing on the equipment side of thing is around backgrounds. So an example uh, of my green screen, which means I can do things like an, I can have um, a picture of an office and I can green screen me so it looks as though I'm actually in the office or I can put a fancy background. So this, this is how you see people who look as though they're on Mars or they've got San Francisco behind them and it looks really, really sharp and everything. It's the same approach that they use on TV and broadcast of just having a neutral color in the background. And then your video software or your editing software can um, get rid of it. And so it, it just works really well and it makes things look a little bit sharper. Finally, on, on equipment, a few miscellaneous things uh, is always have checklists. So I have a checklist for when I'm going to uh, run an event. So if I'm doing a video so, such as today, where I may contact attendees beforehand, make sure they've got the link, this kind of thing. Then before I actually start recording everything, I've got a pre-session checklist to make sure I've turned on OBS, that I've activated the virtual camera, that I've started recording, all that kind of thing. And then a really, really important one, once you've done a video, is post-event. Um, I now have a list of all the things I have to do. And I, I know some people actually use marketing companies to do this for them. But I, when I do things like send a post out to LinkedIn, to Twitter, to Instagram, to Facebook, and so on, I've got a checklist of what I include in each of those to make sure I don't miss out on anything. Onto platforms then, and by this, I mean two types of platform. Uh, platforms used for presenting um, sessions that you're doing, like webinars and seminars, then publishing platforms, which is where you're publishing pre-recorded media. On presentations, the, the ones I tend to use, so we're using Zoom for this call at the moment. Um, there are slight differences between Zoom meetings and Zoom webinars. You've got more control over how the whole session works uh, in Zoom webinars, but Zoom meetings work works fine. I use Facebook Live sometimes to uh, live stream some events. 
Some people use LinkedIn Live, which is a way of live streaming into LinkedIn, but you have to apply for that and not, not everyone um, gets through straight away. But I know some people doing that. And then one of the really clever things you can do is you can use a technique uh, which some of you may know, which is multi-streaming, which is where you use software such as StreamYard or Restream, which take your video feed, so your, your live um, Zoom call or whatever, or via OBS, and it splits it out. So it then live streams it to Facebook, to Zoom, to, to various other things. So it's a way of actually hitting multiple channels all at once. And that's why you'll sometimes see people who are running um, a Zoom call or a Facebook Live, and they appear to be talking to a completely different audience to the ones that you're connected with. And it's because they're running it through multiple streams in some way. So they're all things worth thinking about for presentation channels. Then on publishing, um, I use YouTube, I use Vimeo, I use LinkedIn and Instagram for that matter. Um, YouTube's really useful. I've got my own channel. I've got various playlists. And there's a thing in YouTube now called YouTube Shorts, which is where you do a video of under 60 seconds uh, and in vertical format. So it's designed to encourage you to use your mobile phone. Uh, and that can be a very good way because the, the YouTube algorithm seems to quite like Shorts at the moment. So it actively promotes them. So it gets you a bit more publicity. Uh, Vimeo is a great alternative to YouTube because it gives you better control over how people can access the video and you can embed it into other websites a little bit easier. Um, LinkedIn, just mentioned that with LinkedIn, if you're going to post videos to LinkedIn, some people just do it via linking to a YouTube um, video that they produced. LinkedIn prefers things that stay on its own platform. So if you actually upload a video to YouTube, sorry, upload a video to LinkedIn, then they will rank that higher in when they actually serve that up to people. Whereas if you have, uh, if you've written a LinkedIn post and you have a link to a YouTube video, then it seems to knock that down in its ratings for some reason. Uh, Instagram, growing appeal, probably not so much interest to some people in terms of the industry that they're in, that the market they're going after probably aren't Instagram users. But if you're going after the younger generations, then Instagram is the promotion chat channel these days. And it seems to be uh, taking on as a rival, certainly for brands um, against LinkedIn and, and YouTube at the moment and Facebook for that matter. And then a couple of others, uh, TikTok and Snapchat. I've not used Snapchat. I've done a couple of short videos for TikTok uh, just for the entertainment value of doing 15 second videos. So a few quick tips on how to improve. Uh, you can use various analytics to take a look at if you're producing a YouTube video, for example, you can look at how many hits you get on that video, or if you've um, embedded it in your website, how many hits you're getting. Most important thing at the end of the day is how many referrals and inquiries you get out of it. So I know people who look at vanity uh, metrics, they're always talking about how many YouTube subscribers or followers they've got, or how many LinkedIn connections they've got. You know what? It doesn't matter. It's how much business you're generating from it that really matters. Um, and then there are things like doing SEO optimization, so search and en engine optimization. There are techniques you can use with video production and publishing, which will get the video up on the ranking, which gives it better exposure. Thumbnails, I mentioned a bit before, as a way of marketing collateral. The most important one on here of how to improve is JFDI. For those who don't know JFDI, I think Richard Branson wrote a book on it. It means just flipping do it. So get on with it, give it a go, and then do it even more. And the number of people I speak to who say, oh, yeah, I'm going to give it a go, but I'm just waiting until I get, you know, and it'd be until I get a camera, a microphone, a green screen, a reason to do it, a time to blah, blah, blah. Just get on with it. Do it and learn. If you look at, there's a very famous YouTuber called Mr. Beast. He's got millions and millions of subscribers, very successful, very popular. And he, if you look at his first videos, they were pretty basic and they were done on a mobile phone and he just improved and improved over time. And now he's a, an absolute world leader. So some lessons learned. Um, audio, I would say, is the number one most important thing, even for video. Even though you've got images, 
the quality of the image is less important than the quality of the sound because if people can hear you they'll carry on watching if they can't hear you they won't watch that said whilst audio is number one number zero actually the most important thing is content because it doesn't matter how good the quality of the video is if you're not delivering good content which isn't of value to people so that's the absolute important most important thing then comes lighting i've, I've mentioned about ring lighting that kind of thing that can be useful uh, and then thumbnails to improve the marketing and the other useful thing i've found as well is if you're doing live events in some way being in touch with the other people if i run a number of webinars and panels and that it's absolutely invaluable to set up a whatsapp channel or whatsapp group where we can just communicate live in case there are any technical delays or anything like that i've done that um with a couple of conferences where i've been moderating a panel for a conference and they've had some technical difficulties and the next speaker's not able to come on and so the organizer has been able to get through to me on whatsapp to say gary can you keep going for an extra 10 minutes or something and that the organizers love that because it's giving them a bit of flexibility and it's making you sound even more professional and finally next steps it's really up to you to now think about where you want to go with this kind of thing um, and how we can explore it further so hope you found that of interest Thank you.